dobrý večer. Následujících 30 minut strávíme ve společnosti vynikající francouzské umělkyně Ellen Grimaud. Je to nejenom skvělá pianistka, která má mimochodem exkluzivní smlouvu s firmou Deutsche Gramophon, což ve vážné hudbě je zhruba totéž, jako kdybyste v automobilovém sportu jezdili za Formuli 1. Ale také je chovatelkou vlčí smečky, stará se o záchranu vlků a je zdatnou spisovatelkou. Jsem velmi rád, že si před svým pražským koncertem udělala čas na plovárnu. Ms. Grimo, as far as I know, uh, when you studied uh, at the Conservatoire in Paris, you were a kind of rebel. You could, you could maybe say that, um, but I think it goes also with the age. You know, at that time yeah. when I entered, I was uh, nearly 13, and so I actually spent my adolescence in this venerable institution. Yeah. I was a very insatiable sort of character. I wanted to always discover more, discover ahead of the program, not necessarily the imposed program. So I was uh, trying to go my own way, yes. Is it true that you refused to play a Chopin attitude? No, it's not that I refused to play it. I was playing it, of course, but what I wanted to do was bigger pieces. I always yeah. uh, felt very strongly drawn towards large musical architecture. And so in the second year, there was a, um, a sort of exam at the end of that second year, yes. which focused on shorter pieces. And I didn't want that disturbing me from my plan of learning big Brahms sonatas yes. and big concertos because I was just, um, you know, in a hurry always. That's what yeah. we do, right? As young yeah. people yeah. always want more sooner. So, Was it a boring attitude? No, it wasn't a boring attitude. It was a perfectly nice attitude. Um, but, you know, because we had already learned all of them, more or less, yeah. um, you know, I was just ready to move on to other things. So you had it later on your repertoire? Well, I did during my, yeah. my years of, of study because you have to play most, you know, most yeah. of them, if not all of them, at some point or, or another. It's part of the requisite repertoire yeah. in an institution such as the Conservatoire Nationale de Musique. Do you still remember it? Right. Uh, this particular one, um, well, I sort of do, but it wouldn't probably tell yeah. you much, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as I know, you are the only musician in your family, is it? That is right. Yeah. Yeah, it's still, still a mystery to this day. Although I, I feel I owe my mom quite a bit in that department because she had a beautiful voice. She was always singing when I was a kid. And I think um, from the, in the earliest age, uh -huh. I had this melodious element in my upbringing accompanying me. So maybe that has something to do with it. But yeah, my father is named after Claude Debussy, whose name is Claude. Um, but other than that, there was no, no one who had had directly with music um, to do with music, really, up until that point. So who brought you to music? Your, your, your parents? Yeah. Yes, because they were looking for an extracurricular activity for me to sort of channel this surplus of energy which I seemed to have in school. And of course their, their first assumption was that it was a surplus of physical energy, so they first introduced me to sports of all sorts, <laughs> classical dance and you know, tennis and uh, martial arts, and, but nothing really um, caught my attention. And I would get bored very quickly. I would do a couple of lessons, a couple of sessions yeah. with other kids, and then I'd lose interest. Until I think one of the very last things on their list was classical music, learning an instrument. And so I'm very grateful that, that I had the chance to discover this through their you know, efforts to try and keep me well balanced as a child. So. I think with you, it's, it's uh, uh, quite a physical thing to play uh, piano. You don't seem to be afraid to, to hit it. <laughs> well, um, you know, when, when you need to, of course, it's not appropriate in, in every repertoire, but yeah, I think sure, you're sure. going to stay with me for the rehearsal and, yeah. and there you will get um, a good range because this, yeah. this Brahms concerto has everything from the most tender, delicate moments to the most explosive, you know, yes. muscular mm -hmm. uh, sort of pianistic language that you could want to, to see, so you will We'll probably get a good. I have seen some videos of your concerts. It looks like a risky playing <laughs> that you are well, almost on the edge. Yes, but that's what I think you know justifies or defines or should define um, yeah. stage performance. Because if you go at it in a in a comfortable, secure way, uh, only being you know, sort of satisfied with what you have command over. I think that that's, um, something is going to be missing. Then in that case, we don't really need music performance. You can just stay home with your favorite recording. 
I think what you know makes a concert so um, special is that it has to be an emotional event first sure. of all, and um, and I think you know few people realize how it has to do with a fraction of a second. If something really special happens, time is all of a sudden being suspended, and um, you know you can actually alter time. It can it can stop for a moment, and when all of these people in the audience are being you know touched by something, and you have this this element of shared freedom. It's, um, there is an equality to it, there is something very marvelous. And, and you have to, you have to push your, sort of go to the limit um, and uh, be able and willing to relinquish that control so you can react to the inspiration of the moment. So. You had a good luck that you uh, worked with Daniel Barenboim at the very beginning of your career. Yes. Uh, what did you learn from him? Well, I was very lucky to be able to see a lot of the rehearsals with the orchestre de Paris at the time that he was music director of and so first of all it really in, um, expanded my repertoire horizon because having started piano relatively late probably around eight years you know of age and having that's entered funny. that's funny eight uh, years is relatively late but, but it's true know, but it's true yeah. yeah yeah it is true because at that age you know some colleagues are already child prodigies yeah. playing concerts you know at the you time at which at I was least a bit of your uh, childhood <laughs> exactly you could say that <laughs> And then, of course, having entered the Paris Conservatory at, at 12, you know, I was mostly focused on piano repertoire. And I guess, owing to Daniel, I was able to start really appreciating symphonic repertoire and get to discover a lot of these things. So, um, and I was also very lucky to encounter a lot of wonderful colleagues who um, shared a lot of things in a generous, typical generous fashion, which defines great artists. And um, so Daniel Barenboim was one of them, Gidon Krema, Marta Agerich, um, Nelson Freire, mm -hmm. so many, many artists. So. Do you think it's an uh, advantage if you work with a conductor who is a skilled piano player, that he has more understanding for the soloist? Yes, this is something I used to say. I remember when I first recorded Rachmaninoff's Second Piano Concerto yeah. with Vladimir Ashkenazi. Um, for the first time I realized what an impact this can have, you know, because as a pianist, of course, let's say at the end of cadenza, there is a, a, a run which might be difficult to catch. Um, a conductor who is also a pianist has a, such an intimate knowledge of the physical properties of the instrument. Uh -huh. Just by hearing the way the piano sounds like in the beginning of the run, he will be able to know when it ends. So it's, and there is a special pleasure also, I think, in working with a conductor who has himself played your instrument and knows the, the repertoire intimately in a physical sort of way. So. And he has to like you, because otherwise he can give you a hard time because of the same yeah. knowledge. Vice versa. <laughs> Believe me, soloists can give conductors a hard time too. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, you know, as with any human dynamics, it takes two right, to yeah. make it work or not work, so there's always a shared responsibility. Yeah. So. You don't play too many uh, French authors, do you? No. Like Debussy or... No. Ravel or? Well, I mean, I, I studied a lot of these pieces and actually I'm preparing a program now, um, a new recital program, which will have quite a bit of Debussy, Ravel uh -huh. and, and Fauré. And then of course there is the Ravel Concerto in G, which I've always loved and, and have played quite often. It would be nice to do, to do mm. that here. And it's one of the most, you know, beautiful phrases in music. I mean, for example, this.
orchestra comes in and then the um, English horn actually takes over the phrase and then the piano has this frise which I find also wonderful. <laughs> It's one of the endless melodies. Yes. It, exactly. never, it goes on and on and on, yeah. and it's fascinating. Yeah. And Beautiful. this movement has a, it has a, a purity. Um, it's, you know, it takes after, actually after Mozart, and it's in the purity of lines, but then it also has always this um, sort of special affinity with the way Chopin would have written a phrase, you know, one of those endless phrases. Um, for example, in an etude, you can see that. This Proustian you know, quality of this yeah. of this phrase that just keeps meandering. Yeah. So. You are left-handed, is it right? Yes, it's true. Mm. Do you think it, it might be helpful with some authors? Could you recognize that you would think this composer must have been left-handed too? Because he puts much more difficulties to the left hand. 
Well, you know, Chopin was one of the first ones to have actually emancipated the left hand. Exactly. But as far as being able to tell which pianists were um, or composers were left-handed, that's, uh, that's a bit of a stretch. But I like to think that most of them yeah. were, because at the end, I mean, this is what defines the piano as an instrument too, this, this you know, vertical dimension, mm. not only the horizontal one of the melody, but this counterpoint. Um, so, you know, basses are, there are the, you know, we were talking about um, musical architecture earlier. Yeah. It's, of course, it's the, the foundation of everything, right? This, this harmonic bass. And so there, it's, of course, helpful if it's quite robust. Mm. <laughs> so. It must be fascinating when you have all the technical skills. Mm. So you don't need to care too much about what's happening, you know. And you can just flow with the music. It must be like swimming in the thermal pool or something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice image. I mean, of course, we do all worry about it because this is something that has to be acquired yeah. you know, while you practice a piece. I mean, of course, what you do is through the practice, through the rehearsals, you increase the odds of being you know, so 200% prepared that mm -hmm. you can be totally free at the moment that you are on stage and you have to you know, basically let the music soar and you don't want to be sort of held back by you know, technical concerns. So this is something that you work day in and day out to achieve. Um, you know, some people have more sort of innate um, facilities than others do, but you know, at the end, that's what we all look for, this expressive freedom. Is there a special passage in any piano concerto that would make you get goose skin? Did you see it coming and you say, oh my God, it's here again. Um, <laughs> it's this nightmare. Uh, no, not, not. Not really? really? No, I mean, not, not after, I mean, once lucky you're playing you, the piece, then, you. then, you know, it becomes a part of who you are. I mean, if you're afraid of it, then you probably shouldn't be going out on that, on that stage. Um, I mean, it's good to have a, a, you know, a healthy dose of respect for the piece. Yeah. You, want, you never want to take the piece for granted and think, ah, no problem. I mean, that's yeah. because the music will always show you that it is, yeah. you know, stronger than you are and you always have something to learn. You know, Yodi Minuin said this wonderful thing about how you only truly know a piece when you've made a mistake in every single place of that piece. That's the only assurance that it will not happen again. But until it does happen, that possibility always remains. Yes. So again, you have to have a, this respect for the work, but at the same time, um, you yeah. know, once, you're, once you're playing it, you have, to, hmm. you have to be free. What was your first uh, encounter with uh, the wolves? That was a long time ago when I first moved to Tallahassee, Florida. Yeah. And uh, I had no particular if I'm honest, I will tell you, I had no particular interest or prejudice uh, about wolves in particular. I loved, <laughs> I loved all animals and, um, you know, always had this you know, strong interest in biology and natural sciences and, and you know, the environment. And, um, but I was more um, actually interested in, in studying precisely at that moment um, social behavior in primates. So ethology, the, the, the science of, of behavior. Um, but I met this wolf, this high content hybrid, that's really what she was. But nevertheless, she was so you know, different from any domestic canine that I had mm -hmm. ever had the chance to meet up until that point. Um, I was very intrigued. And actually she acted as an ambassador, which is the reason why the Wolf Conservation Center, the organization which mm -hmm. I founded in 1997, is based on that principle of having you know, some ambassador animals which help build a bridge of understanding and, mm -hmm. and concern for their wild counterparts. Because this one animal that I met back then in, in Tallahassee, Florida, Alewa was her name, um, she was really the one that motivated me to look into the cause of this misunderstood predator and yeah. to start the Wolf Center. So. so how many wolves are there living now? At the moment, 22. 22. Yeah, in different you in know different all packs. Of them by names? Well, most of them do not have names because they oh, actually they belong to the to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They are part of I this see. reintroduction uh -huh. program. Uh, they are what we call SSP wolves, Species Survival Plan. It's a wonderful program. It's a, um, a program run by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN, and nationally it's run in the United States, of course, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the AZA. And it is destined uh, to, you know, supervise the captive holding and breeding of some of these most endangered um, species and subspecies. In the case of the Mexican wolf, it is the most endangered subspecies of the gray wolf. And the red wolf is a species. And so these two animals we are currently working with at the, at the Wolf Conservation Center in preparation for their reintroduction. And they are pretty good singers. 
the wolves. Yes, they are. They are. They have a very, very beautiful howl. And uh, what I also find very interesting, you know, they, they always talk about, they study you know, what the purpose of the howling could be. And one sort of function of the howl, which I like very much, it's something which we call social glue. Mm -hmm. It is something which generates a lot of good feeling within the pack. Something that you could probably uh, equate to humans singing around a campfire or uh, singing at a sports event. It's something which yeah. basically reinforces the bond, you know, to one another. Mm -hmm. But also other ways that is used, for example, uh, advertising that a certain territory is occupied. And what I find interesting is that when a wolf starts to howl and another one joins in, if they land on the same note, on the same harmonic, yeah. one will immediately switch, which produces more overtones. And in the end, you always have the impression that there are more wolves than there actually are. Um, because of this acoustical, you know, yeah. this, this harmonizing, which is very nice. Does it bring something back uh, to your musical uh, skills? I can't really say. I mean, you know, of course, um, according to one of the founding precepts of the German Romantic movement, um, yeah. there is definitely a lot of truth. You know, nature is the ultimate muse, really. Um, mm. And all of these composers, poets, mm. um, writers, paint, not to mention painters, of course, um, found usually their inspiration in nature following mm, this sure. this idea that you know nothing we don't invent anything we just rediscover what was already there mm. in that sense it is something which has given me a uh, strength for sure and which has been a renewed source of inspiration whether it directly connects with the music i'm not sure one thing which is clear is that if you you know interact with um with a wild animal an animal that you cannot expect to meet you on your terms It's always a lesson of humility and you need to have 100% of your attention in the moment, um, you know, physically, spiritually, emotionally, um, intellectually. And that is very similar to what working on a piece of music requires, where you basically enter this, this tunnel and the piece has to give you the keys to, to its own secrets, basically. So. At the beginning of your career, you didn't play too much Bach, as far as I know. Now you do. Well, no, that's not true because I had a wonderful teacher, yeah. uh, Pierre Barbizet, who um, taught me very early on that Bach should be your daily bread yeah. and that you should be, you know, every day um, starting. It's fascinating music and, and it's surprising all the time how modern he was. Are you still surprised with Bach? I am. I'm, I'm always, every time I listen to his music, I think he is definitely the, probably the greatest of all, of all geniuses, a depth, a profundity to the music, but at the same time there is a universal quality and that's absolutely mm. wonderful. And it doesn't matter if it's a prelude or if it's the beginning of the Chacon, I mean whether it's something like this. And It's always something which um, makes you feel small and makes you feel, you know, so insignificant and yeah. at the same time connected to, you know, the, the bigger picture. So, something very powerful. Well, thank you so much that you made our spectators feel small, <laughs> I guess, when they watch you. No, can no, no, do. you know, the, yeah. the, because I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the smallest of all of, of, all of them, right? I mean, in, 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 that's, that's what makes the role of an interpreter so... Um, so fantastic because you are just just a channel, basically a medium in the literal sense of the word, mm -hmm. between the world of the composer and the world of the listener, um, and this is your role as an as an open channel, yeah. um, and um, it's a privilege. Well, it was a privilege to have you here, thank you. and thank, thank you, you so much, much for sharing your time with us. Thank you, thank I you. enjoyed it a lot. Thank you very much. Dnes byla naším hostem na plovárně Ellen Grimo.